first talk today will be from Kylie Walters. Uh, Kylie is a senior investigator and section chief in the National Cancer Institute of the um, NIH here in, uh, in the US. Her laboratory merges structural, chemical, and cellular biology approaches to find the mechanisms of regulated protein degradation, ubiquitin signaling, and protein quality control. Um, Kylie's been trained in the field of biophysics as an undergrad at Wesleyan University and then obtained her PhD in biophysics from Harvard um, and moved on to be an American Cancer Society postdoctoral fellow um, in the pathology department at Harvard Med School. Um, she began her independent career at the University of Minnesota and then moved her group to NCI where um, her lab seeks to develop new therapies against cancer by modulating functions of the proteasome and proteasome related proteins. So today we'll be hearing a talk uh, from her specifically about uh, RPM13. Uh, so Kylie, feel free to take it away. Okay, many thanks. Um for that kind introduction and also um, for the opportunity to share our research here today and also to the organizers for putting together this fantastic seminar series. I know that I have really enjoyed it and I think the field has really benefited from it and thank you for making it so accessible to everyone. Um, I'm gonna just start by, um, sorry, I'm having trouble, oh, here we go. Um, I'm going to start by just uh, putting up and making everyone aware of this in-person FASA meeting in um, ubiquitin, focused on ubiquitin, ubiquitin-like proteins. We have a terrific lineup of speakers and also a ton of additional slots to choose speakers from um, abstracts. And we're really welcoming any newcomers to the field and especially uh, junior scientists. So hopefully, um, people attending this seminar series are also able to register and attend um, this in-person FASA meeting. Well, sorry, I'm not sure why, but my slides are not doing a good job advancing. <laughs> um, sorry, okay. Um, I wanna start off just by kind of highlighting the team of people who are involved in the research that I'm gonna to present today. It was really spearheaded by Xu Xu Lu, a very talented research fellow in my group. And then also we were benefited by the synthetic chemistry expertise of Venkata Sabasani and Rolf Swenson. And then also um, the CRISPR expertise of Raj Shri, explore expertise of uh, Charles Schweitzer and then mass spectrometry of by Thalkal and his team, um, Nadia Tarasova helped with molecular modeling and also is a chemist. And then Vastio Siam Panza um, is a cell biologist who um, helped perform a couple of the uh, experiments. And I'll be acknowledging them at the bottom of my slides. Their names will be there as I go forward. Um, so this is like a one of the structural states of the 26S proteasome. And in um, yellow is are, are highlighted the um, core particle beta-5 subunits, which are what's targeted by bortezomib and carfilzomib, which are um, established treatments for hematological cancers. And um, the focus of my talk today is going to be more in the um, in the 19S regulatory particle. And so components of this um, include the ATPase ring, which seats against the alpha subunits of the core particle. And then there's um, substrate receptors that recognize ubiquitin chains on proteasome substrates. And I'm really gonna be focusing here on the RPN13 PRU domain. So um, RPN13 in humans have two functional domains. Um, one, which is the PRU domain that's used to recognize ubiquitin and also um, assemble into the proteasome. And then there's a C-terminal DUBAD domain that's used to bind to one of the proteasome's three deubiquitinating enzymes, uh, UCHL5. And really today I'm gonna be um, talking about uh, RPN13 PRU domain. And so this domain, as I mentioned, it binds to the proteasome and also to ubiquitinated substrates. And Shushu Liu um, in my group, 
who I had mentioned earlier, um, solved the structure by NMR of this domain um, complex with a 14 amino acid C terminal extension in RPN2. So you can see RPN2 up in orange here, and it has an intrinsically distorted C terminal re region that um, binds uh, with like. Uh, 20 nanomolar affinity to the RPN13 crew domain. And this structure was sold by Shushu, by NMR, but also in Chris Hill's lab um, by X-ray crystallography. And one of the kind of interesting features that's going to come up a little bit later in the talk is the crystal structure is extremely well defined. And the NMR structure, for the most part, is two, and it's very similar if you kind of just look at it at this level of just trying to look at a static structural state of the complex. But what was kind of interesting was also in the NMR data is this loop showed signatures of chemical exchange. So even though it's binding with a very strong nanomolar affinity to this C terminal region in RPN2, there's signatures of chemical exchange um, indicating that it retains some kind of dynamic properties as it binds to this binding partner. And so RPN13 um, kind of has been for a while known to be um, a potential therapeutic target for cancer. And this effort began um, with Richard Roden, a collaborator, um, searching for alternatives for core particle inhibitors. And as he did um, that effort, he ended up pulling out an inhibitor that turned out uh, an inhibitor class that turned out to be active against um, RPN13. And so this is kind of uh, the, the best of that compound class. So this is RA190. It's a calcone type um, compound, and it can bind by Michael addition to either one of um, these alkene sites here. And independently, also um, in Tom Kodadek's uh, lab, uh, they used phage display and ended up coming up with another kind of um, peptide derivative that also bound to RPN13. And in both cases, these class of molecules were able to target RPN13 and induce um, apoptosis in cancer cell lines and restrict uh, myosinograph studies. And I should mention um, that it was Darcy Trader in Tom Kodadek's lab um, who did those studies. And, but anyway, this, this class of compounds are actually, as you can imagine, rather promiscuous. So this is just an experiment that Xu Lu did, where she uh, looked at reduced glutathione reactivity with RA190, and she found um, that it was substantial. So uh, a concern of this compound class is the off-targeting. And in, But what was really interesting and motivating is that we also had CRISPR cell lines. And if you look for induction of apoptosis as induced by um, RA190 treatment, then it occurred in uh, wild type cell lines, but not in a HECT116 colorectal cancer cell line where RPN13 is deleted. And so this was uh, promising and encouraging. So we went forward and tried to use the structure um, that Shushu had solved at, to do a virtual screen um, and pull out binding compounds. And so our best way of screening for binding or the way that um, kind of turned out to be really reliable was NMR spectroscopy. And so what you're looking at here is a 2D NMR spectrum of RPM13. Um, and then this, so this is just revealing like every amide that's present in the protein. So it becomes a wonderful signature of sequence across um, the protein. And so in black here is just the free protein, and then as we add in different compounds that were pulled out of the virtual screen. And so in this case, in purple, what you can see is a case where it was where it can't bind. So this compound number six failed to bind. And we had a lot of failures, actually. Um, but Shushu was tenacious and hung in there and ended up finding this compound number five that we're calling XL5 that we could see signatures of binding and um, and, and, we were also, and we were able to go forward and find that it mapped to the binding site that we were hoping to target. And so, and what you see here is just seeing that it has efficacy in cells. So the way that um, we did this initial experiment was to look in a multiple myeloma cell line, the orange RPMI8226 uh, cells, and then compare it 
in a wild type colorectal cancer cell line in black, and then um, that same cell line that has RPN13 deleted. And you can see greatest sensitivity for the multiple myeloma cell line, and that the colorectal cancer cell line was less sensitive, but that sensitivity that it had was reduced with the loss of RPN13. And so this was encouraging. And so we went forward and we mapped the um, changes that we saw in NMR in the NMR spectra across the sequence, found it targeted to the um, expected binding site. We tried to get crystals, um, but the crystal, we did get crystals, but it was lots of unligated RPM13 structures. So we then turned to NMR and um, we were able, and we were able to by NMR see um, interactions between the compound and, um, and the protein. And so this is an example of that where there's a methyl group in this four methylbenzamide of the XL5 compound. And you can see interactions between that methyl group and the threonine 39 methyl group of RPN13. But what was really interesting was that we also saw um, evidence of the alkene that was present in this molecule um, becoming saturated. And um, so, and then we could go through and, and assign these uh, signals and find them to correspond to, um, the, to, the, to the saturation of, of the alkene to, to have a hydrogen um, here at what we're calling position 13 and position 19, which corresponds to these uh, regions in this spectrum. And so this obviously indicated that it was covalently interacting um, with RPN13 and um, by mass spectrometry, we could further validate this. Um, so this is just showing mass spectrometry spectrum of the RPN13 crew um, with a DMSO vehicle control. And this was with XL5 and we can see it um, shifts to the expected molecular weight from um, ligation of XL5. And so it was interesting because in this virtual screen we did, we were not intending to covalently target RPN13, um, but RPN13 has a very conveniently placed cysteine, the cysteine 88 here. Um, so naturally compounds that can take advantage of that through Michael addition get selected out. Uh, but we were of course concerned of whether this is gonna be um, promiscuous as we had um, previously seen with the RA190 class of compounds. But when Shushu did the um, exact same experiment where she incubated it with reduced glutathione, in fact, we, she saw very weak um, reactivity uh, because um, it's, it's a much weaker, um, it's, it's a much weaker covalent binder. And also what we observed was, whereas when we acquired data on RA190 binding to RPN13, we really, we could not detect um, NOEs. So these are, these are, um, intermolecular, so in NOEs between RPN13 and the compound, and um, they occur because of dipole-dipole coupling and, because, and um, record interactions where protons are within five angstroms of each other. And whereas with RA190, we could observe chemical shift changes, um, we could not, this interactions were not stable enough to record this type of information. And this type of information can be used to solve the structure. Um, and so um, we were able to do that. And whereas in this set of spectra, you have RPN13 labeled and the compound unlabeled, um, we are also able to label the compound and get the complementary set of um, set of interactors looking from the other side. And so we had really good confidence um, with our assignments of um, interactions between the compound and RPN13. And also we recorded um, all the expected spectra that you would uh, um, acquire to get the structure of the complex. Um, what's shown here is a um, spectra recording all the interactions that occur within RPN13. And we could see that the structural core was um, preserved with the binding of the compound we could take all the assembly of information and solve the structure um, of XL5 ligated to RPN13. And that's what you're seeing here with XL5 in orange and the RPN13 crew domain in purple. And so what was really interesting is if you remember kind of at the beginning of the talk, I had mentioned that one of the interesting features of the NMR structure of RPN13 with its binding partner at the proteasome is that loop maintains some degree 
of chemical exchange um, and you know, highlighting the dynamics of that loop, even in a case where it's with a tight binding partner. And indeed, what we observed in this structure was it's binding to the site that was targeted, but it's doing through, through, so through a rearrangement in that region. And so if you look here with the RPN2 structure where it kind of comes down into this um, RPN13 kind of channel where, it, where that 14 amino acid sequence kind of fits in. In this case, what you see is an intercalation of XL5, the benzoic acid into this hydrophobic pocket. And for that to occur, you have um, this region in the molecule, uh, kind of the beta hairpin kind of lifting up and out to um, allow the benzoic acid to kind of fit into there, into that nice little pocket. So I think this kind of highlights one of the challenges of doing virtual screening, right? Because if the binding region can actually have dynamics to accommodate a compound, then it's then at least the screening we were doing was quite rigid. And so with, with that approach, when we took just the RPN13 and screened for binding and we pulled out XL5, it's actually not binding in, exact, in the spot um, that was pulled out by the experimental structure. And so in some way, I think, um, I think we got a bit lucky and, we, and Shushu was very tenacious and just uh, did a lot of biophysical screening. And on the other hand, it could be that perhaps this site kind of, maybe this is an entry site and then um, the, the uh, change is induced, but we don't really have any data on that. Um, what we do have is extensive data on how the compound is interacting with RPM13. And we did chemical probing to kind of confirm importance of certain groups. So in here again, you're seeing the benzoic acid buried into this nice pocket. And this carboxylic acid group is having an anion and pi um, interaction with the central benzene ring. And we could test uh, how important that was by making a substitution and putting a sulfonamide group there and then um, going through and seeing, you know, is binding maintained or is it reduced? And in fact, what we found was it was sizably reduced. So this is the NMR spectra. Um, with this derivative of XL5 added compared to um, XL5. And you can see um, kind of prominent shifting with XL5 and being able to see a bound state, whereas in this case, um, the NMR data indicated weaker binding. We could go forward and get um, a binding affinity for XL5 for RPN13 to be moderate at 1.5 micromolar affinity. And so then um, because of that moderate binding affinity in part, we wanted to, and because we had the structure, we wanted to um, turn it into a protac by putting it on an E3 ligase warhead. So I think this seminar series, people here are very familiar with uh, this approach, but just to remind you of the catalytic cascade um, where ubiquitin is activated and through um, an E2, E3 like um, enzyme pair, um, the ubiquitin, the, um, ubiquitin gets transferred to a substrate, and then in, in some cases, then the substrate um, become, um, is recognized by the proteasome and degraded. And so in this case, um, we were interested to see if we could apply this approach by putting a E3 ligase on um, XL5 to take out protein of interest, in this case, the RPN13, and um, turn it into a protac that um, XL5 into a protac to end up with it ubiquitinated and then targeted at the proteasome. And this is kind of an interesting concept, right? Because RPN13 is a substrate of the proteasome. So, um, but we decided to test this and try this. And so looking at the structure, it seemed reasonable to um, put the E3 ligase warhead um, where this methyl group is ex expanding from there, because although it was interacting um, with a threonine methyl group nearby, it was uh, this region of the molecule was largely exposed. Whereas you can see in here, and it's kind of not so obvious, but this other regions of the molecule are more buried. And when we just tried making a um, derivative of the compound where we had expanded from this methyl group, 
uh, it the compound was still able to bind and it was able to bind with like 1.7 micromolar affinity so we'd only weakened it a little bit and um, so anyway we then took XL5 and we um, put on a VHL uh, warhead and this is just uh, looking at one of the assays we did where we're looking at cell viability and so looking at XL5 and orange and just looking to see that that uh, VHL ligand by itself doesn't um, restrict cell viability, but now when we have XL5 uh, with VHL, um, the, cell, the uh, cells are more sensitive compared to XL5. And so the, we were able to then get IC50 values and taking it for from set about 17 for XL5 down to um, about four for XL5 with the VHL warhead. And what we were really interested in trying to establish is, is there RPN13 dependency for XL5 VHL? And again, and so had a um, colorectal cancer cell line where we had deleted RPN13, but that cell line, the, the parental cell line wasn't that sensitive um, to the um, RPN13. And then because RPN13 is a um, proteasomal ubiquitin receptor, um, it's kind of hard to do the TMT experiment because we actually, because a lot of proteins are affected just by um, losing RPN13. So we did the TMT analysis uh, with um, XL5 VHL2 in the multiple myeloma cell line with RPN13 deleted and did not find any um, other protein pulled out. Um, but then we went forward and, and wanted to have an idea of how potent is it because we had concerns because it's, it's not a very potent protag. But, um, so we went forward and we just looked at it at increasing concentrations and we could see the induction of apoptosis. And what was really interesting um, initially was we were expecting to see RPN13 um, go down in abundance, but it did not. But rather what we saw was another RPN13 product that was reduced in size that was going down um, with the XL5 VHL treatment. Um, and this, and so the DC50, it's fairly weak. It's um, just under 40 micromolar and the T1 half is 16 hours. So we're still trying to improve this compound. But what was really interesting was it is VHL dependent. So if you treat um, the cells with VHL in addition to XL5 VHL, then you end up um, not, not targeting RPN13 PRU. Um, and if, you, if we used a VHL epimer um, that had, a, uh, had altered stereochemistry so that the VHL E3 ligase warhead, VHL warhead didn't work well, um, then, it, and then we no longer saw the induction of apoptosis. Uh, we used mass spectrometry to figure out exactly um, the nature of the RPN13 PRU that was being targeted. And I don't have time. In fact, I'm noticing I'm running out of time, so getting a bit nervous about that. But um, we figured out that it, run, it includes the PRU domain and it's losing the DUBAD domain. And in do doing a immunoprecipitation experiment for the proteasome, um, we find um, the RPN13 PRU at the proteasome, which is consistent with it having that PRU domain. It's also able to be pulled out by the RPN2 binding site. And when we pull it out with the binding site, um, as you probably noticed in the, in the immunoblots that I was showing, we always see these prominent, um, particularly these two upper molecular weight bands when we treat with XL5 VHL2. Um, and we can also see them when we're blotting for ubiquitin. And so if we just kind of take the molecular weight of RPN13 PRU as determined by mass spectrometry and the molecular weight of the full length protein, and we just calculate what it would be with one, two, three, or four um, ubiquitins present, what we find is that these two bands that we um, kept seeing and that we see prominently here could potentially be um, RPN13 PRU with three or four ubiquitin moieties on it. It could also be the full length protein um, with two moieties on it for one of the band. And then the band that we consistently see just above um, the RPN13 full length protein is consistent with 
um, RPN13 crew with two ubiquitins on it. And then we see a weaker band that could be RPN13 with one ubiquitin on it. But of course, these, these, um, this is just a consistency. Uh, we can't preclude the possibility that there are other post-translational modifications that yield um, these higher molecular weight bands, and we're still investigating that. But from a structural perspective, um, we knew already that the two domains of RPN13 interact with each other, and this is just showing some NMR data showing that. Um, and I don't have time to really go into that, but what I can show you is the structure that the two domains interact with each other, and compared to having these uh, full-length protein when the two domains interact, there's greater accessibility for the XO5 binding spot um, when you don't have the DUVAD domain there. And um, we also reasoned that if the sensitivity of the cells to XL5 VHL2 was through RPN13 PRU, then that would make sense that the HECT116 cell line and other cell lines that don't have that species in abundance um, would be less sensitive and ones that do have it would be more sensitive. So this is just looking um, at other different cell lines. And so the one that we tested was this other multiple myeloma cell line. I already showed you also that colorectal cell line and you can see reduced sensitivity for the colorectal cancer cell line, but sensitivity for the other multiple myeloma line. And so um, what we, so the RPN13 PRU seems like a likely target. It's, um, and, it, and why might it be upregulated in certain cancers? Well, what we know is that the regulation caused by the interdomain interaction would be lost. The tandem activity that occurs with its associated deubiquitinating enzyme UCHL5 would be lost. And um, UCHL5 would be lost to proteasomes bearing RPN13 PRU. And I already showed you that it is at the proteasome um, in immunoprecipitation experiments. And, also, it may potentially be a marker of proteasome dysfunction. So one of, I didn't have time to talk about how it's generated in cells, um, but um, it seems to be generated by the proteasome itself. And when you treat cells with perfilzomid, um, you can see a reduction in RPN13 PRU and a prominence of those two bands. And we're not actually the first to observe this at all, but Fred Goldberg's lab has been observing this for some time, as has have other labs been showing ubiquitination of RPN13. And we think that potentially what they might be seeing is per, um, at least some of this being contributed by RPN13 PRU. Um, and so anyway, I'm kind of, I need to wrap up, but we're further optimizing um, optimizing the compounds. So now that we have the structure of RPN13 with XL5, we can use this now to do a new virtual screen. Um, and uh, we've already done that. We're already making progress in that. So compared to XL5, we pulled out another um, higher affinity compound and we're kind of still pushing on this to get it down. And I think I've kind of run out of time, but we uh, feel that we have a new anti-cancer target in, in RPN13 PRU and that it itself might be um, a, a signature of uh, RPN13, sensitivity to RPN13 targeting strategies and we're um, optimizing our compounds and moving forward to look in other tumors for the presence of RPN13 PRU and expanding out um, effort with uh, two new collaborators, Bev Mock and Deb Citron, um, who will help us with the translational aspect. And so I think I mentioned pretty much everyone who contributed, and I'm sorry if I went over. 